Welcome to Digging for Truth, sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Once a year, Pastor Brian Wendell joins us to highlight the best top 10 discoveries in biblical archaeology from the past year. Today, he joins us to do our annual countdown of the top best discoveries of 2020. Good to see you again, Brian. Thanks so much, Henry. It's always great to join you and talk about biblical archaeology. Yeah, we're, we're going to be, uh, you're going to be piloting the ship today fast. We're going to be moving at warp speed. So we ask the audience to buckle in and get ready to go. We're doing our top 10 countdown for 2020. So before we get into it, though, why don't you share with the audience a little bit about, please, um, a little bit of what criteria you use to uh, determine the top 10, because there is some subjectivity involved in all this. There absolutely is. And every year I sift through about 200 news stories or more from the world of biblical archaeology. So every week, one of my jobs for ABR is to write a breaking news um, update on the best news article from the past week in biblical archaeology. And then at the end of each month, I do a top three on my own website, BibleArchaeologyReport.com. And then at the end of each year, I take the top 10 from all of those reports through the year. And here are my criteria. Um, first of all, the discoveries have to be directly related to people, places, or events mentioned in Scripture or to the composition of Scripture itself, as opposed to many of the discoveries from the world of biblical archaeology, which are helpful. They provide background information on the culture, but for the purpose of this list, I've chosen to narrow my focus. And the second thing is that they have to either be um, studies, new studies, or new discoveries um, that, uh, as opposed to announcements. So oftentimes announcements are made in biblical archaeology, which make news. They're important. In May 2020, for example, they announced that they were beginning new excavations at the city of Petra in Jordan. Now, Petra is a hugely important site. That was big news, but I haven't considered it for my uh, top 10 list. And, and finally, I should note this, Henry, 2020, as we all know, was quite a year. And the pandemic led to the cancellation of many, many excavations. Despite this, there were some great discoveries in the past year. And so I'm really looking forward to talking about the top 10 with you. All right. Well, in that regard, my friend, let's jump right in and start with uh, number 10. I believe you want to couple that with number nine. I think they're a little bit of a relation sure. there. So why don't you go ahead, Brian? Sure. Well, the number 10 discovery on my list was um, the bulla from a servant of King Jeroboam II, was, which was authenticated. Um, this was done by a professor at Ben-Gurion University. And the bulla's impression is almost identical to um, a much larger jasper seal that's quite famous, the Megiddo seal of the servant of Shema, uh, the servant of Jeroboam II. Uh, but that one was lost in the early 1900s. It has this um, roaring lion image. It bears the Paleo-Hebrew inscription saying, belonging to Shema, the servant of Jeroboam. And uh, when this particular bula um, came from the antiquities market, most people thought, no, it's just a forgery. Um, it was only purchased for 10 old Israeli shekels, if you can believe it or not, from a Bedouin antiquities dealer. And uh, But when the, the professor and the scholars at Bengarian University started doing tests on it, started looking at the composition of the clay, started looking at the patina and studying the inscription in high detail and comparing it to all sorts of other bula that they knew of, they recently announced that they were authenticating it, that it is actually an authentic seal impression of um, Shema, the servant of Jeroboam. Um, now, if this is correct, this, of course, affirms Shema, who we don't know from Scripture, but it affirms King Jeroboam II, the son of Joash, from 2 Kings 13.13, 13, who we do know from Scripture. Okay. So that was number 10. That's number 10. Number, now, how about number, number 9 is interesting because, just real quick, Brian, I'm sorry, in the 19th century, scholars used to say that this guy didn't exist from Isaiah 20, verse 1. Why don't you go ahead with that one? Yeah, so this is uh, Assyrian reliefs that were discovered um, of, of Sargon II in Iraq. Ten stone reliefs on the wall of an ancient canal system um, were discovered in northern Iraq. Now, they have been noted, the tops of them have been noted in 1973, and they started doing um, a survey of the, of the site in 2012, but then it had to be postponed because of 
um, when ISIS took control of the area. But in the fall of 2019, they actually did excavations. They they um, they unearthed this carving that had uh, um, the main Assyrian god and goddesses riding on animals and and a king, an Assyrian king who the archaeologists believe. Um, is Sargon II paying homage to the gods. Um, and of course, this was on the wall of a canal system. The canal was used for irrigating probably the barley and wheat fields nearby that, that fed the city of, uh, of Nineveh. Now, as you mentioned, Sargon II is mentioned in Scripture, and for a long time, there was no other confirmation of him outside of Scripture. And we now, of course, know quite a lot about Sargon II. He was a real historical Assyrian king, and this is yet more evidence of that. It's a great lesson, uh, once again, you know, when scholars say this or that thing from the Bible hasn't been discovered, uh, just let's wait it out, church, and see what happens, because here's, here's another example of it. We've known about Sargon II for quite a while. Okay, so uh, we said we were going to go warp speed, so here we go. Number, uh, number eight, this has to do with King David. Go ahead, Brian. Absolutely. King uh, David, uh, um, I, when David reigned, there was a kingdom called Geshur, and um, they recently unearthed uh, a fort fr in the Golan Heights that dates was in use from the 11th to the 9th century, so right in the time when David was king in the 10th century, um, and they believe that it's Geshurite, and the reason for that is that they discovered this stone with these two horned figures with outstretched arms, um, and it was similar to um, a relief that was discovered at, at Tel, which many scholars believe was the capital of the kingdom of Geshur. And so they believe that these two sites were linked both politically and spiritually, both um, they've interpreted these um, these images as people worshiping the moon god. Now, how does this relate to King David? Well, in Scripture, King David married Makkah, the daughter of Talmai, the king of Jeshur. That's in 2 Samuel 3.3. And it was to Jeshur that Absalom fled, seeking refuge after he killed his brother Amnon in 2 Samuel 13, verse 23. So this particular site shows us and, and gives us more information about the kingdom of Jeshur at that time. Yeah, another another example of sort of a his, historical background. You know, we don't have an inscription that says you know David was here or something like that. But but again, this is another example of we have the description of the kingdom of David, and uh, in that context, that's exactly what we find consistent with scripture. That's right. That's right. Time and time again, it aligns with what we know about scripture at that time. Well, very good. Like we said, folks, we were going to be uh, moving quick. We've We've gone fast-paced through our first segment here covering uh, three archaeological discoveries from 2020. The top 10, we're doing a countdown. Please don't go away. We'll be right back with Pastor Brian Wendell. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here today with Brian Wendell, ABR staff member, and we're counting down the top 10 discoveries of 2020. Now, Brian, uh, we're, we're, we're moving quick. We're at number seven. We're going to talk about a synagogue that was discovered at Beth Shemesh. Why don't you go ahead? Sure. Number seven is a first century synagogue that was discovered at Beth Shemesh. Now, uh, as often happens in Israel, they were building a highway. And as they were building this highway near Beth Shemesh, what they discovered were the remains from a first temple site. And so they diverted the highway. And when they diverted the highway, they had to call the archaeologists back because they found remains from a second temple era site. And at that second temple era site, what they discovered was the remains of a synagogue. And so they couldn't divert the highway yet again. So they dismantled the synagogue. They're hoping 
funds permitting to reassemble it somewhere else. But it's an important discovery because the Bible says that Jesus frequently taught in synagogues all around the area, particularly in Galilee. And um, so any first century synagogue that we can find is very helpful to help us understand um, where Jesus taught. And there are a group of scholars who still don't think that there were synagogues in the first century, that those were something that came after 70 AD. And I think yeah. we're up to, um, I think Dr. Scott Stripling has documented, I don't know, eight or, or more um, first century synagogues from the area. So an important discovery. Yeah, we Number have a six. Yeah, we want to just point. Uh, sorry about that, Brian. Point people to a previous okay. episode with Dr. Stripling, all about synagogues. I interview him about that, and we encourage people to watch that episode. So go ahead. Number six. I don't want to get in your way. Yeah, no. Six is a first temple era weight that was discovered near the Western Wall. Now, this is a two shekel weight. It dates to the first temple period, and it was discovered in material from excavations that were carried out beneath Wilson's Arch near the Western Wall. And it was found in debris that had likely been used as part of the backfill when Herod the Great expanded uh, the Temple Mount. And it was interesting, it was missed in the initial excavations of dry sifting, but it was found in the secondary process of wet sifting. And of course, as many of our viewers know, wet sifting is a really important process that ABR uses in, uh, in our digs at Shiloh. And so this, is, uh, this was a find that was uh, found in that process. And this two shekel weight um, is interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, we know uh, from history what a shekel weight was. It was an 11.5 grams. And when they weighed this particular um, two shekel weight, um, we know it was a two shekel weight because it had the two slashes un underneath it, which, which demonstrated that it was a two shekel weight. And when they weighed it, sure enough, it was 23 grams. Now, given, given the location of the discovery right near the Temple Mount, with something that was likely used, um, given the shekel's importance in matters relating to the temple, this is yet more evidence that the temple was actually located on the Temple Mount exactly as the Bible seems to indicate and certainly as historical writings would indicate. All right, Brian, now uh, here we go. We're breaking into the top five. Number five, sir, please go. Number five is a Bronze Age Canaanite temple that was unearthed at Lachish. Now, archaeologists who were excavating there um, unearthed a, a structure that they identified as a Bronze Age Canaanite temple. And um, it had two columns and two towers, had a large hall. Now, what was really interesting was when they went into the inner sanctum of it, what they discovered there were two smiting god figurines. And so these two figurines are, are quite famous throughout Canaan. They, they're found all over the particular area, the smiting god figurine. Many think that it represents the Canaanite god Baal. Now, what does this have to do with Scripture? Well, um, this is in an area that was Israelite um, at the time. This dates to the time of the Judges, and it would certainly seem to affirm what's written in the book of Judges that um, in Judges 2, 11 and 13, it says, Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. And so we have here evidence from a site um, in Israel with a Canaanite temple with the Baals that would seem to affirm what Scripture was saying. So that was number five. Why don't I just go on to number four, too? Number four is um, an ancient Hebrew inscription that was unearthed at Abel Beth Makkah. Um, this uh, scholars were analyzing the uh, a rim of a jar, a large wine jug at Abel Beth Makkah, and they discovered an inscription that reads Lebanayu, which means belonging to Benayu. Uh, this is a Hebrew name we know because it has the classic Yahwehist ending to it, um, and they believe that it was they believe it was found in a storehouse that belonged to a Hebrew man named Benayu. It indicates obviously a Hebrew presence in the city of Abel Beth Makkah at the time. Now, why is this important? Well, uh, minimalist scholars believe that Abel Beth Makkah was not Israelite in nature, Hebrew in nature, until much later in the 8th century BC. And yet we have evidence in Scripture that it was populated by Israelites in the 10th century BC, because in 2 Samuel 20, verse 19, during the days of King David, Abel Beth Makkah is called a city that is mother in Israel. And so what do we have now from Abel Beth Makkah? We have um, um, 
uh, an inscription that is Hebrew, that dates um, right to the time of David, 10th or 9th century BC, indicating a Hebrew presence in the city, just like the Bible describes. Fantastic. Now, uh, uh, Brian, a couple thoughts. One is uh, for number five there, we were talking about uh, Lachish. Uh, just for, so our viewers know that uh, down the road, uh, we're going to have uh, Dr. Michael Hazel on the show, who was the lead excavator, co-excavator at Lachish. And so, friends, we just want to ask you to look, look for that episode coming up in a few months uh, with Dr. Hazel. Uh, and then this, the second part here is we have about uh, 45 seconds left in this segment, Brian. Maybe you could just expand on this dating controversy just a little bit for Abel Beth Makah and, the, and what the minimalist scholars say. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about that? Sure. I, I mean, it's a huge it's a huge issue that you can delve into and go down a, a rabbit hole. But basically, sure. there are um, scholars who want to uh, shift the dating, in particular, as it relates to the time of King David, so that things that we would point to to say, see, um, that would be related to King David. They would say, no, 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 that's much later in time period, probably the time of, of Hezekiah or Manasseh or Josiah or, or one of the much later kings. And so um, minimal scholars look at Abel Beth Makkah and they go, no, 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 the Bible describes them during the time of David, but that was really, really only the time of the 8th century BC or so that it would have been Israelite in nature. And so the importance of this discovery at Abel Beth Makkah is that we have something dated to the 10th century, which is clearly Hebrew in nature, just as the dating in scripture would indicate. Yeah, it fits the paradigm that we would advocate much better than the other paradigm you just described. Well, friends, we're, we're counting down the top 10 discoveries in archaeology in 2020 related to the Bible. We'll be right back with our final segment. Don't go away. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Pastor Brian Wendell, and we're counting down the top 10 archaeological discoveries of 2020. Brian, we are now on number three, and you're going to couple two, uh, three and two together. Three is actually not a discovery per se, but it's a pretty sad discovery, but it needs to be talked about. Why don't you go ahead and talk about it? Sure, it would fall under the um, criteria of um, discoveries or a study of discoveries related to the composition of Scripture. And it was the announcement that came out in March 2020 that all of the Dead Sea Scroll fragments that were held in the collection of the Museum of the Bible were forgeries. Now, there, were, uh, there was some debate about them all the way along, but um, the Museum of the Bible had Colette Lull of Art Broad Insights um, do, uh, gave her complete independence to do a study to determine whether they were authentic or whether they were forgeries. There was no input from the Museum of the Bible, and um, they guaranteed that the report would be made public immediately, which it was. And what they discovered was that um, the fragments were um, on the wrong material, first of all. Most of the authentic Dead Sea Scrolls are on parchment, um, and these were on leather, which is much thicker and much bumpier. Secondly, testing revealed that the fragments had been soaked in some sort of an amber liquid, probably with the attempt to try and give them the sheen of the real Dead Sea Scrolls. And microscopic analysis showed that the ink um, that was written on them actually pooled in the cracks of the ancient leather. And so um, it was all clearly painted onto already ancient leather. And finally, they discovered that they would just been dusted with um, dust from Qumran. And so the conclusion was that these particular fragments, all of them in the Museum of the Bible's collection, were... Um, forgeries. Now, it has what, much wider implications than that, because um, in 2002, a group of about 70 or so 
new Dead Sea Scroll fragments uh, hit the antiquities market uh, out of nowhere. And this group from the Museum of the Bible were part of that group. And so if these are all forgeries, it certainly does call into question the rest of those particular ones. What it does not call into question, and this is really important, are the original Dead Sea Scrolls. Those are authentic and very important witnesses to the composition and transmission of Scripture. So that was number two. You're right. It was a sad announcement, but an important announcement that we get that settled and, uh, and they did that right. Agreed. Number two was a much a much happier discovery. <laughs> Number two was uh, was this Iron Age Judahite administrative complex that was unearthed um, in outside of the old city of Jerusalem, and evidence suggests that it operated as an administrative center and storage facility during the reigns of Hezekiah and Manasseh in the eighth and seventh century BC. Now, what they discovered within this site were over 120 jar handles that were inscribed um, in, in ancient Hebrew, and some of them with the phrase lamelech. Lamelech means belonging to the king. Very famous handles that have been found with this stamped winged scarab all over uh, sites all over Judah. And um, the other, uh, a whole bunch of the other um, jar handles were inscribed with with the names of, of probably uh, the rich and the famous people in the area at the time. Interestingly, they also found little um, cultic idols and figurines at the time. Now, all of this helps us understand a little better the administration of the kingdom of Judah under Hezekiah and Manasseh. And it's interesting that these idols were found because Scripture is clear that for a lot of Manasseh's reign, he abandoned the practices of his father and and with great wickedness worshipped idols all throughout the kingdom. And so yes. that was number two. Just the sheer number of handles alone makes this one of the most important collections ever discovered in the kingdom of Judah. So it was our number two find of the year. Yeah, this divided kingdom period, you know, Hezekiah and the other these other kings, is we have such an embarrassment of riches, it's remarkable. And just uh, one editorial comment I'll make too, back to the, the fake Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a lot of fake stuff information out on the internet and social media about archaeology too. We just want to tell folks that are watching, when you hear about a discovery, go to the ABR website, go to Brian's uh, Bible Archaeology Report and vet it before you pass it on and try to share it as an apologetic or something like that. Uh, We're here to serve the church in this way to help people vet these kind of discoveries. So it happens on the lay level too in social media. Now, with that thought, Brian, it's drum roll time because we've reached number one, and I'm going to let you go ahead and share with the audience the number one discovery from 2020. Well, the number one discovery from 2020, I think, was number one on just about everybody's list. There are a number of people who make uh, top 10 lists at the end of each year. Uh, Gordon Govier does an excellent list for Christianity Today. Todd Boland does an excellent top 10 list at his website, BiblePlaces.com. Uh, I do my list. I'm, I'm sure, I think it was number one on all of them, and it was these stunning capitals from the first uh, temple era, a palatial structure discovered Um, in Jerusalem. Uh, There were three capitals that were discovered. Capitals are these uh, beautiful, ornate um, column heads, and they exhibit a design that's very famous in Judah at that time. And when they unearthed one, uh, the archaeologists were thrilled, but when they took it out, they discovered a second one underneath it, and they appear to have been intentionally buried. And um, so this residence was dated to the 7th century BC based on the pottery that was there. And what's really interesting is that it dates to after the period of the Assyrian invasion. And so what it seems to indicate is that um, the rich and the famous people at, in Jerusalem at that time obviously felt secure enough in and around Jerusalem after the Assyrian invasion to be building these beautiful vistas and royal states outside of the city walls. And it also testifies to the wealth in the kingdom of Judah during that time, which is something that's alluded to in Scripture in 2 Kings 21-13. Just the sheer stunning nature of this discovery, the beauty yes. of them. Um, it, it just it was the number one find on everybody's site, and it certainly um, helps us to understand the kingdom of Judah even better at that period in history. 
Well, fantastic job, Brian. Well, believe it or not, we've only got about 20 seconds left, so I'm going to have to close the show and say thank you very, very much for doing this, counting down these top 10 discoveries. You do an excellent job for the ministry, and thank you for the hard work that goes into it. Top 10 discoveries of 2020. Friends, we want to thank you for joining us, for Digging for Truth. Thank you for uh, being here today. And uh, we just want to encourage you that you can trust the Bible. And these top 10 discoveries from 2020 demonstrate just that. We hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you for watching.